just getting started, but we're very excited to have August Cole with us this morning uh, to talk about burn in. Um, I'm actually just just checking my my Audible to see this morning to see if the download has become available, and I, I see that it has. So, um, and your book, what is it, two days old now in terms of the it being officially available? That's right. Yeah, Tuesday the book uh, went live uh, in hardback, in audiobook, uh, in an ebook. So we're we're really excited after you know almost three years of uh, of, of production to get this uh, into the wild. Well, it's it's great to have you with us this morning. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of the folks on the on the call today will probably have been uh, fans of of the Ghost Fleet. And you know, on behalf of the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress, just let me say welcome to folks that are joining us now. Uh, we're very happy to have August Cole uh, to talk about his new book, Burn In. And um, it, you know, the, the topic is is really something quite interesting and relevant to a lot of the work that we're doing at the center. Um, we, we have a 55 year history of convening around issues that relate to challenges um, between the executive and the legislative branches and in delivering value to the American citizenry. We largely focus on um, issues that relate to specific national security areas and do a lot of convening that involves the private sector. Of course, what we what we have found is we end up focusing on areas where there are rapidly advancing technologies, uh, largely because those technologies are challenging for uh, policymakers to keep up with. Uh, that provides a role for uh, organizations like ours and the Atlantic Council and others to try to fill in the, the, the knowledge gaps and ensure that policymakers kind of understand the current state of technology so that they're making appropriate policy that fits um, where technologies actually exist. Critical to that mission, of course, is looking to the future. Whether we're looking 30 years down the road or five years down the road, um, we want to ensure that policies being made today are oriented to the challenges that are coming, not just the ones that are well understood. Uh, and so we appreciate, August, your effort to, to look into the future, the not too distant future for us, and kind of help us think about what that future will, will look like based on what we know now uh, and do it in a way that's exciting and interesting and, and kind of fun. So I, I look forward to, uh, I, I just downloaded the audio version, look forward to making that part of my summer listening. And I know a lot of the folks that are joining us today will, will also have that goal. So uh, thank you again on behalf of CSBC for, for being with us. Why don't I go ahead and offer you the opportunity to describe the book and the process and uh, what the key takeaways are, and we will get back after that to Dan to um, curate uh, questions from the participants. August, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for allowing me to engage uh, not just with the center, but the audience. Uh, this is a really unique time to find ways to connect with one another for those of us that are really passionate about the future of our country future of democracy and the intersection with technology and, and, and of course, conflict too. You know, I had a lot of days where I wish the future would just stay at bay. Uh, mm -hmm. There's been a lot of moments in the, in the last, you know, few, few months, uh, if not even weeks and days and, and hours today, where, you know, we're getting a glimpse of, of what lies ahead potentially, you know, certain futures that I think we really do want to avoid. And, you know, uh, a book like Burn In, which follows the story of an FBI special agent, Laura Keegan, who's a Marine, who's a robot wrangler in her service uh, with the Marine Corps and has become a counterterrorism uh, agent and is forced uh, to work with a robot partner on, uh, on what becomes a very high profile case. And, and it's not only a story of, of this pursuit of a, of a, of a terrorist, uh, but it's really about America in the 2030s. If the trend lines that we're seeing today around automation, around uh, economic uh, you know, dis, dis, uh, disenfranchisement, if uh, political, uh, populism and extremism uh, grow. We're, we're, you know, seeing a world in which, you know, data drives a lot of that division that is uh, exploited uh, for for profit and for for advantage. And so, in the midst of that, of course, people have to live their lives. And so, the the attempt to you know create a story like Vernon, you know, is, is different than Ghost Fleet in the way that we're following one character and really seeing it through Laura's experience uh, on the pursuit of this this case, but also what it's like to be a parent. In, in the 2030s when you know data and AI shape many of the conscious and unconscious choices when your spouse loses their 
job to an algorithm uh, and how that affects everything from your home life to how you pursue you know a target in a counterterrorism investigation you know stepping back from that too you know we're now at like the 100 year mark of the, the introduction really of the word robot uh czech playwright had a play called r-u-r which depicted the, essentially like a robot uprising which of course is the narrative that is, has become really popular and certainly affected me you know, I think I saw Terminator when I was like 10 years old, and uh, I don't know why my parents let me do that, but they did. Uh, and and I, you know, I think I'm not alone in, in having that you know, at the fore of how I have thought in the past about what humanity's future with you know, this increasingly powerful computing technology that fits into the family that we call AI, and, and also uh, everyday robotics, which are you know, more and more becoming part of our understanding of what, what our, our next decade or two is going to be like. I mean, you don't have to look any farther than Washington, D.C., where the book takes place right now to see little bots trundling along delivering you know, midday sandwiches. And those are small examples, but I think meaningful ones, too, because of how we start to understand what that our actual future with robotics won't be like the Terminator. Uh, and, and the things that I worry about actually are less the robot uprising, but how the, these sorts of technologies and the trends that they uh, uncork, uh, how we're going to handle that as humans. And so this is, uh, I think, a very uh, important theme in the book and trying to alert people to some of the risks that we're courting uh, in the policies that we have, in the, the approaches that we take in adoption of, of technology that may be introducing as much vulnerability as you know, economic or social or or uh, you know, kind of cultural advantage. And so, so this is a chance, like with Ghost Fleet, and we tried to, to, to have a conversation about the future of the US-China uh, strategic rivalry and exploring you know, some of the assumptions about what a great power war might look like and where we had blind spots. You know, this is trying to do something similar around AI and robotics. Can I ask you to talk a little bit about your background in journalism and covering the defense industry and how that kind of helped shape your thoughts on this? And, as you're writing the book, were there surprises? Were there, um, did you kind of surprise yourself or hit upon any kind of thoughts or notions that you hadn't really set out when you started writing the book, when you sort of start unpacking how the, all these things might play out when it comes to robotic technology? Can you talk a little bit about the connection in that arc? Sure. You know, and even though I, you know, I haven't been a reporter for a decade, that that is where I started out in, in, in my professional life. And I felt very called to the public service aspect of journalism and, and was lucky enough to work at the Wall Street Journal covering defense, as you said. And, you know, being exposed to, um, you know, companies, bureaucracies, uh, really interesting people gave me a lot of perspective about how Washington works. You know, and prior to that, I worked at, uh, at uh, marketwatch.com as a financial journalist, both during the dot-com boom in the 90s and through the crash and through kind of what came after. And having seen not just the evolution of a very disruptive uh, media company, but also the larger internet economy and how much faith uh, it plays in the role of understanding how tech is going to change our world. You know, living in San Francisco in like 98, for example, you know, you could see the fervor that, that you almost had to have to uh, will that future into being. And it has arrived, in fact, maybe not at the, the speed or at, at the, in the uh, kind of pacing that a lot of people would have expected. But you know, through that experience, working in the tech sector, covering it, writing about it, building it, uh, then working for a more traditional publication of the journal and really trying to understand how the major uh, you know, events and themes start to take shape in a, in a you know, this just happened uh, way. Um, I also though, too, as a journalist felt writing about what just happened wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to write more about what was going to happen. And so, uh, you know, leaving that behind to embark on this path, which has literally been 10 years this spring, um, has, you know, certainly been a very twisted road, uh, twisting road, you know, with a lot of points where I wonder if it was the right choice. But, you know, I think that the more I have been able to do the kinds of research that is all about finding the kind of, uh, you know, whether it's primary source documents, interviewing people, the same skills that you use as a reporter to build these fictional worlds, the more validating it feels like this is the, the right decision. And, you know, sure, that culminates in a book where you have to, uh, you know, synthesize all this together. And in a book like Burn In, as with Ghost Fleet, we are very transparent about how we do our research. You know, it's an unusual blend of fiction and nonfiction that we hope can speak to people who ordinarily don't pick up a thriller. And for those who are passionate readers of thrillers, you know, who start Saturday morning and don't stop till, till Sunday night, we'll take a book on vacation and, and kind of disappear. Um, you know, it also is, is you know, very, very suited to that, that type of reader, because when you're trying to use fiction versus, say, a front page story, 
you know, you're, you're able to reach a really wide range of people and, and in the conventional ways that I might have ordinarily, uh, you know, shared my ideas or concepts would have been, let's say, a white paper or an op-ed, you know, a short story or a book like Burn In can transcend and leap over a lot of the silos or barriers uh, that, that often keep people from talking about the same thing. And given that so many of these discussions today about technology do narrowly focus and don't often consider the second and third order effects, or really try to understand things like in the, in the most holistic sense. Um, you know, fiction to me is a really good approach to doing that, especially when it is really reported out. And, and Pete as well, uh, you know, Pete Singer, my co-writer, is a, a very ardent researcher, loves getting into the history of and the story behind technology particularly. And we've been really, uh, I think, a great team in that regard because we can both use that, I want to find out more feeling, but also know that you know you don't need to dump your notebook into a story too. This is always a challenge when you're writing fiction. How much how much detail should be there, um, you know, when you're world building? And so I think we're, we're we're a nice partnership in that we both kind of have approached that with a very serious fact based you know mindset. And you know, Ghostly we started out um, not with the intention of having the the end notes in the book. And it was really towards the end where we felt like we had offered the reader a very fantastical story, but, but certainly plausible, and that having the end notes would really allow them to you know, connect with it in a, in, a, in a way. And especially given how seriously we wanted the book to be taken, we thought that was a, a wise step. And in fact, I had an experience at Fort Benning uh, doing a talk and walking around the, the, one of the, the jump areas there with a, with a master sergeant. And he's like, you know, the book checks out. And I said, didn't really know what he meant. I was like, great. Okay. I'm glad you liked it. He's like, no, I, I checked all the footnotes, every single one, like you're good. And, I, <laughs> and, and that was a nice moment to know that, that someone had appreciated the, the work that went into it, but also was using them as a, as a, as a reference point, right? For further research, further thinking, further exploration. And that's critical. And certainly the case with, with Vernon, where we have like 27 pages of, of end notes, you know, that doesn't disrupt the flow for, for, for a reader who wants to be lost in a story, which again, I think is essential. You got to get people to the end. Uh, right. But at the same time, somebody who's trying to, you know, understand why we gave Laura Keegan's husband uh, a job as a lawyer that he lost to an algorithm. Well, there's a footnote for that reason why. Interesting. We're already starting to get um, some audience questions, and I'm going to turn it over to Dan Mahaffey in a moment to let him start to field some of those. Just want to remind the audience, um, you can submit questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, and Dan will remind us shortly what the code is for people that are calling on the phone. Um, I wanted to ask one more question, just something that's on my mind in the meantime. It, it's um, sort of semi-related to the book, but you know, you, you take a very solid understanding of, an, of a current situation and extrapolate some things into the future as part of the thought process of the book. And you, obviously you wrote this before COVID-19 pandemic became something that started to drive a lot of thinking in terms of what the future looks like and how it changes. And, you know, although I'm, I'm hesitant to define, to, to define moments as having a, def, a very solid or easily defined end point where you're past it, um, I'm just curious if you, if, if you have thought about the COVID-19 pandemic in the context of how you thought about the way the future would play out in the book and did it, steer you to rethink any of the trajectories that you predicted in the book or or was there any other sort of did you hit upon any other notions that might be helpful for people who are thinking about how the COVID pandemic bends the arc of any of these technological developments? Well that's a really good question and something that that I've been thinking about every day. The the really interesting thing about the last few months has been to see how much the arc of technology adoption has uh, let's say comp the curve has compressed and gotten steeper, and and that is something you know in in the context of the book you could look at for example the way people are working remotely uh, from from home something that is a feature of the society that we envision and burn in, I mean that just moved forward in a matter of weeks if not you know a couple a month or two something that 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 would have taken let's say a decade or so you know when you think about the way people who are in the industries around say telemedicine. You know, they're looking right now at the transformation of healthcare at a, at a rate that, you know, again, is a matter of months when they would have thought that some of the uptake would have, could have taken 10 to 15 years. So, in fact, the future that we've described in Burn In, for better or for worse, on the rising role of automation, whether it's UV blasting bots that are cruising through grocery stores or distribution centers, whether it's the rise of gig work, 
whether it's the rise of functional unemployment, you know, if half of employable Americans are unable to work right now because of pandemic related closures, you're looking at a, at a scenario that's not dissimilar to those that are forecasted in university or consulting company reports looking at job replacement from automation. Of course, they're not causal right now, they're, they're separate, but the larger forces, and, and to me, worryingly, the inability of our society to respond to essentially figure out a way that we can create enough social and economic stability uh, that's something to me that is certainly right out of the pages of burn in and has been dropped in our laps. So the, the, the world that we envision in 2030s already in 2020 is starting, starting to appear. And it's something that I think when people read the book, it may give them pause, but also hopefully empower them. I don't want to have people feel the sort of dystopian helplessness, you know, where you just kind of put your head in your hands or under your pillow after you, after you go to bed, if you're reading the book, I want people to stop and say, okay, you know, I see the way this is going and I don't like it. I want to figure out a way to make a change. And that empowerment, I think, is a crucial part of fiction, but not to kind of induce sort of a helplessness or like, oh, man, we're just hosed. Rather, I'd, I'd like people to say, I actually care a lot about, like, let's say, data privacy or the value of, like, identity in my role professionally in society. And I think there's a way to create a, a narrative around that where what I do as a person still matters and that it's something, for example, I don't want to maybe Teaching would be a good example uh, of a role that we may decide isn't something that could be reduced to proxy, you know, or uh, essentially synthetic personalities over a screen, things that are certainly that are they're really possible now with conventional machine learning technology, um, you know, to have, say, virtual teachers or, or, or you know, a blend of virtual and, and human instruction for, you know, elementary schoolers all the way up to, to college. That's all real and all very possible because all of that technology and burn-in is, is, is in development or, or already deployed. You know, we can draw those direct lines from, you know, May 2020 all the way out to the 2030s of, of Laura Keegan's world. Thank you. Let, let me turn it to Dan Mahaffey for the moment. We've got a few questions stacking up, so I'm going to let him start getting to those. And Dan, if you'll remind folks again how to submit questions from the phone, I, I failed to, uh, to help people that are on the phone lines. Uh, yeah, my tech support role, if you are on the phone, uh, it is star nine uh, to raise your hand for a question, then I can patch your audio in. Uh, otherwise, please use the Q&A function, or if you would like to chime in digitally, uh, use the raise hand function, and I'll see that on the participants list here. Uh, but the first question we have in the uh, Q&A hopper, uh, 300 predictions in the book. What did you think was the most significant or surprising thing that you came across? That's a really good question. And, uh, you know, nobody has a favorite favorite child, I guess, but I, I, would, I would say it this way. You know, there were two dynamics that really, uh, I think, struck me and, and continue to occupy, you know, the way I think about what's happening now, but also what's ahead. The first is around how fractured our society is, the role that algorithms play in social media uh, driving division uh, and, and having not just virtual consequences, but real world ones. You know, the latest Carnegie Mellon study looking at the open movement, for example, finding that half of that is bot traffic. Uh, you know, that's a form of AI warfare, in effect, and whether it's, you know, uh, a domestic campaign or, or it's foreign, uh, it, it doesn't matter right now in the sense because the effect is immediate and real and creating discord and, and again, real world action. Uh, so I worry a lot about that division that we're seeing exploited for political, uh, partisan, uh, economic gain being uh, a feature of the landscape and, and thinking about this aspect of trust in systems. And you know, we look at trust in the sense of how does uh, Agent Laura Keegan trust her robot partner, Tams? But the larger sense is how, do, how, does, how does an individual in 2020 or in the 2030s you know, trust that the government is going to be largely doing the right thing to ensure that they're you know, healthy, safe, prosperous? And, and that is something that is certainly uh, being eroded, if not under attack, for, for a variety of reasons. And, and that's incredibly worrying and the more I modeled that with, with Pete and thought through then what, then what, uh, it's, it's very disquieting to, to move things to that end. And particularly if people feel like they can't do anything about it to, to steer, steer us back on path. And, you know, the other aspect too, in that kind of 300 of uh, 300 you know, predictions and kind of forecast has to do with the vulnerability of the internet of things, you know, being connected to conventional industrial systems. And, it ties back to trust as well. You know, if we don't believe that our water will be safe, if we don't believe that our power will go on when we want, uh, you know, we're, we're choosing, uh, you know, in an in a internet of things world to connect as much as we can, as fast as we can. Yet we know the vulnerabilities on the consumer side, for example, are horrendous. 
and there's not a lot of responsibility being uh, assumed yet to to shore that up on the industry side and, and government you know may try or may not so we can understand that that is going to introduce that or it's going to degrade resilience to some extent when that data is out there and it's not secure uh, and then when you start thinking about cyber vulnerabilities to things like water systems you know israel just went through an attack on uh, a significant cyber attack on a water a treatment facility that mirrors something that, that I don't want to spoil the book, but that it's very significant in, in, in Bernian. And if you think that, you know, the Israeli infrastructure, you know, software and security engineers uh, are doing uh, a worse job than people who are uh, managing the upriver water treatment and, uh, you know, flow facilities in the DC area, you know, I think that's something that we have to start to reckon with as well. But as we connect more, as we try to automate more for economic or, or efficiency reasons, because we can also, you know, I think say that, if you're allowing the connection of you know, myriad devices that offers incredible efficiency in terms of energy consumption, you know, thinking about the climate change challenge, for example, you know, how do you create a society that uses less energy and does so efficiently? You know, the Internet of Things and, and the all on every, every uh, you know, every day uh, Internet uh, of, uh, of, of our, our infrastructure, but also you know, domestic devices is certainly a part of that solution. But there's incredible vulnerability that goes with it if we don't have the right mindset. So, Thinking about you know the impact of both of those two elements and predictions on essentially American resiliency, I think is something that is continues to stay with me. A question that follows on to that, where you point out the divisions, is one where our attendee asks about the the splittest groups, the white supremacists, veterans groups, scavengers. He lays out the ones that you've laid out in the book. Uh, given the drivers of those divisions, as you discussed, the algorithms. Are we as a society ready to address these divisions, do you think? Do you think we'll be able to handle them? Where might, and I think we see it too now in the debate about social media and fact checking uh, blowing up as that has to. Who in society is able to handle these changes? As a society, are we able to handle these changes? I mean, that, that may be one of the most, most important questions that's, that's hanging over us right now. Uh, you know, the, the, the really kind of fundamental belief, I think, as, as an American, that we are stronger together, uh, that we can act with compassion, but also decisiveness in terms of doing the, what we you know, collectively believe is, is the best for our, for our country. You know, is, it sounds a bit, a bit you know, hackneyed, but, but I do think that that's a very fundamental return to a kind of collective will to, to do better and be better. Uh, you know, in the same way that we, we teach our elementary school kids this, and I see it with my own children, you know, there are there are some almost remedial aspects to the political environment that I think deserve attention. And and yet, you know, that is not the way that we are seeing the shaping of national narratives, uh, you know, all the way uh, at the, the highest level, all the way down even at the, at the local level. And so I think there's room at the same time that creates opportunity for leaders who see value in an America that can move past some of this division that can resist the sorts of attacks that are being waged, particularly as they're as they're incredibly efficient and, and hyper targeted. You know, the personalization of disinformation, especially as we move into the augmented reality world, is going to be even more disruptive. If you think Twitter is bad and the closed Facebook groups are bad, imagine walking around with an augmented reality set of glasses on that's essentially shaping your environment to fulfill either a commercial imperative or someone else's political priorities. Uh, or you know, making you angry or about your world for reasons you can't quite articulate, but yet are being algorithmically shaped. So you know, that sounds quite dystopian, right? And, and it is, uh, but I think we need to be able to understand that that's not a world we're destined for if we can start to take action and, and see the sorts of political leadership that is much more about building bridges than, than, than you know, dividing people or, or finding ways to, to exploit division. Another question we have here, uh, Ghost Fleet, the way it took off in the Pentagon. Did you expect that when that happened? And is there a community or segment that you'd really hope to see uh, this book catch on with? That is a really good question. Um, when, when we wrote Ghost Fleet, you know, neither Peter or I had, uh, had, had written or published nonfiction. I'd written another manuscript that sits in my drawer still. Um, uh, that that was one of the reasons that led me to work with Pete on, on Ghost Fleet, and so I, but we felt strong enough that it was it was worth a gambit to try to try to recreate the same feeling that he and I had when we read Tom Clancy's Red Storm Rising, uh, which came out in 1986, and you know that was a formidable book at the time because it obviously had a lot of like technical details that that Clancy specialized in, but what it did was it sort of 
went and followed through in thinking the unthinkable. You know, what would uh, a global conflict with the Soviet Union look like? And who would be the actors and who would be involved? And so the, the, the mindset behind Ghost Fleet was we want to take that, that mantle, but update it for, you know, 21st century, obviously, you know, considering the focus on counterinsurgency and counterterrorism, uh, you know, at the point when we started writing it, we felt was there was too much, uh, there was not enough attention being paid to, to China's technological, economic, and political uh, designs on the next decade or two. And so setting Ghost Fleet in the kind of mid to late 2020s, you know, we don't specify when, was and and you know envisioning what a China might look like in that window, which was quite different from how it was being talked about in 2012, 2013, and particularly to the over reliance on technology, at least uh, in the in the sense that you know America could uh, easily defeat China due to its military uh, technological capabilities, seemed to us like a an assumption really worth exploring, and and that's not different than running a war game or, or a red team, but that that kind of mindset was was what we had. Uh, we didn't know if we'd be laughed at, to be honest, or if we'd be, you know, just sort of patted on the back and, and told nice work. So it was really heartening to see that, that people connected with this narrative, and I think gave me a lot of confidence in the in the power of fiction right now as a way to try to make sense of a world that is, in in effect, so complex and moving so fast, and other times moving so slow that traditional foresight or analytics often struggle to keep pace with it. And so the, the idea of a novel, particularly one like Ghost Sleep uh, and, and even Burn In, that is going to show perspectives that don't often get heard in the national security conversation. You know, we were looking in Ghost Sleep at what is Anonymous's wartime role in a great power conflict, for example. Uh, you know, could Americans operate as insurgents, you know, in a territory that was occupied by, by Chinese forces? Uh, flipping a lot of paradigms on their head uh, was important to us and trying to use that also to get perspective on how uh, the US military was, was looking at how it might, might operate in, in, in the future environment. With, with Vernon in, in the audience, you know, it's, it's a more of a, a domestic story, you know, kind of a homeland security story if you look at it from a, you know, which bureaucratic bucket does it fit in. But I think it's extremely relevant to people who are in our defense department, in our national security community, because it is about the changes in society that are happening right now that are going to accelerate and fundamentally affect all facets of American power. And, and as much because the, you know, the armed forces of the United States draw from our civilian society, you know, we have an all volunteer force. And so the composition of our future force is certainly going to be impacted by what's happening on, in, our, in our civilian uh, society. And so for, for me, the hope is that that aspect of it, in addition to just realizing how pervasive and disruptive AI is going to be, just as AI is going to disrupt the legal profession, as it has disrupted finance with machine speed trading, for example, you know, it has extreme implications for how our uh, armed forces organize, equip, and train, uh, recruit, for that matter. And so there's a lot of hopefully meaty stuff that people can sink their teeth into as they try to figure out what's next, particularly, again, in the great power uh, conflict context that, that you know, we, we envision ghostly. And, and they do exist in the same universe, right? These are not stories that you know, one is not a sequel to the other, so to speak, but but they do exist in the, in the same universe. And I think that's something that uh, when people tuck into it, those who have read Ghost Sleep may pick up on that a little bit, but that was kind of a fun aspect for us to create some some connective tissue between the two narratives, which which again have similar themes about, about technology. The size and scale of the challenges you describe, you raised them in your comments there, and it's been raised in some of the questions here from our audience as well. The automation, concentration of wealth, loss of jobs, et cetera, those trends you discuss. Do you have confidence in our political system to address that? What do you think our political system needs to address it? I, I, I you know, referring back to the earlier question um, from Glenn about the kind of acceleration curve from, from the pandemic, it has shaken me uh, in a sense in terms of our ability to respond to the kind of macro or almost existential implications of some of the trends that are out there with AI and robotics. Uh, you know, I am not as confident as I was three months ago. And, you know, some of this, of course, is the, the bias of the moment, uh, being able to look at what's around you and think that that's going to extend forward into the future, which when you're doing foresight, I think is always a mistake. So trying to kind of see a, a future scenario from the perspective of not me today in 2020, but someone living in that world, that makes me a little more hopeful that people will start to take responsibility, that leaders will begin to see the opportunity uh, and responsibility as well at that level to, to do something about the situation that we're kind of sliding into. 
but if we are in the sense of like almost like being in an autonomous car it's like heading for a brick wall if you can't put your hands on the wheel uh how are you going to save yourself or save your family for example and i think that's some one of the themes that that is really important in, in trying to consider as we make sense of not just the news today but you know what's on the news in 2030 and and again we, we explore a little bit of that in, in, in burn in and, and it will be eerily familiar i think for a lot of people at the same time the hope is that the way we get from here to there, that we bridge, you know, this fictional world in the future, you know, may be something that allows us to, in fact, in the end, create a create a different outcome. I certainly don't don't want to live necessarily in the world that Laura Keegan does, um, but I may not have a choice, uh, you know, for all my my aspiration to to kind of have more agency over over the future that we we do live in. To to follow on that, you the. As you said with Glenn, yes, the speed of these changes and uh, one of our attendees notes on, on social media, you talk about the, the press makes this seem like a distant thing, then you can juxtapose that with the Boston Dynamics dog robot uh, video. Uh, how do you think people are doing in terms of appreciating how close these challenges are and how close these trends are? And beyond the effort in your book, what do you think policymakers can also do to help people appreciate that? The, the great uh, sci-fi writer, William Gibson, who's one of my heroes, ha had a quote about, I don't know, 18 years ago or so that was, it was, you know, something as simple as, you know, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. And, and to me, that really speaks to the situation we're in, in part because our awareness of, of technology, you know, it should be as high as, 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 as it possibly could be, given the way we can share concepts and ideas or, you know, Modog videos on, on, on Twitter. Uh, at the same time, understanding what the implication of the arrival of, you know, a biped robot like, let's say, Boston Dynamics Atlas, or, you know, uh, Facebook's embrace of, of machine learning to optimize its, its, you know, sharing platforms for, for social media, you know, speaks to the difficulty sometimes in thinking through how these different elements uh, will affect one another and how they'll affect us each individually. And this, in a way, is an invitation to 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 read more fiction that that's, that allows you to take a character-driven approach. That you're not looking at policy from purely uh, a, a legal or a legislative perspective. Uh, and even those, you know, studies or models that look at you know implications allow us to do some thinking of what it's like to exist in a world where, let's say, legislative changes come true. But truly building a, that world out from a character driven perspective, particularly if you're allowing people to be in that story who aren't ordinarily there. A good example would be in, in an Atlanta Council project we did, uh, War Stories from the Future. We were trying to, to understand what might cyber war be like uh, in the world's most connected city, right? Because if you can look at that today, you can understand a bit the connectivity trends and, and, re and understand and realize that, that most cities will, will be quite close to that you know, future uh, city today as the city of tomorrow. And what was a lot of fun in working on that was, you know, the writer came up with this idea to look at that perspective from the two least connected people in that city. So this is a city in South Korea, and it was told from the perspective of two street vendors who are effectively falling in love in the story. And it's a really marvelous way to get a wholly different point of view that, you know, a traditional approach to writing that, that story might have looked at it from the head of cyber defenses or somebody in the tech sector. And, and really shifting uh, perspective is something narrative does effectively. You know, the book, the, sh the story, you know, whether it's oral or written, uh, is one of our, our most effective technologies as a human. And obviously it has different permutations today. Uh, and it's getting harder and harder to break into people's attention span. You know, there was a Microsoft study a few years ago that said, you know, essentially human attention right now is less than a goldfish. It's like kind of 11, 10 or 11 seconds. That, that may or may not be true. I won't admit to having an attention span any longer than that. but. I feel at the same time, if you really do want to hook people for a while and, and, and begin to invest your ideas into their lives, using narrative is a really effective way to do that. And so that doesn't mean that, that you know, a, a lawmaker needs to become a literary uh, critic or, or a writer necessarily, but it does mean using, I think, narrative in more aggressive ways. The Cyber Solarium Commission just did this with its introduction to its, uh, its latest report. Uh, Pete and I created a short vignette inspired by essentially some of the calamities in Vernon in part to, to sort of shock people that when they're going to read this very well thought out product of a, of a, of a very uh, traditional and effective way to look at what is ahead and what should the priorities be today in the cyber realm by having a fictional vignette of like, here's the stakes. Uh, this is why it matters. You know, this is what it's like to live in a world where we did this wrong. 
uh, I think you can uh, grab people's attention and, and, and you know, hopefully you know, spur them to action uh, so we can avoid some of the futures that, that, that we can imagine. A recent study, as one of our attendees points out, uh, showed that Facebook drove people to extremist groups. The algorithms would eventually guide you towards extremist content, uh, that the, uh, the debate over the scope of deep fakes is another one that we, we see. Uh, how do you see those trends and concerns worsening in the AR, IR era, as you, as you talked about, you briefly talked about with the glasses and, and AR reality? How do those trends worsen, you think? Well, I think there's a really interesting uh, side effect too when you're creating personalized worlds that today, you know, is there's a debate, I guess you could say whether your iPhone's on or off body, but once you start to do on body computing and, and, and sensing, uh, you're, you're producing even more data that allows even better personalization. And that may be really effective to, you know, market me new tires for my mountain bike, because it, my Garmin watch told, you know, the, the online retailer that I'm in you know, a certain amount of miles or whatever. But it's more profound if, for example, I'm being targeted by an ad that understands that my bank account balance has been drawn down to zero or that, you know, there's been an, uh, another tragedy in my life and I might be more susceptible to an emotional nudge to take action in the real world to participate, for example, in an extremist movement. Uh, you know, the, the hyper-targeting that we're seeing perfected in conventional social media platforms, in, in just regular marketing too, uh, is going to be potentially a lot more insidious when it starts to shape and bend our reality in the real world because of these overlays. And I, I don't even know that, that virtual reality is required to, to, you know, to, to get us to that point, that in fact, going about your day uh, and being constantly nudged and pushed and tweaked to either be angrier, uh, maybe happier, um, is something that that is going to have a positive effect. And so this this whole larger conversation of free will is really interesting too. When we start to see how the prediction uh, aspects of AI technologies like machine learning uh, function, you know, if I'm producing enough data in 2025 or 2030 that I can walk into a Starbucks and my drink is ready before I I get there. And it's in fact the right drink that I wanted because of the bio data, the metadata, uh, the other forms of information about my environment that the algorithm can bet it knows what I want. And in fact, can serve that up probably with the robotic um, barista. And if it gets it wrong, of course you can get another one. But the point is, and that's, that's a scene in Vernon that's I think one of the creepiest in, in many ways because it speaks to that predictive analytics aspect that, that really makes us question you know, what, what choice will we have in the future? And these are fairly small decisions. What kind of coffee do you get? But you can see how that has massive implications for voting, has massive implications for uh, dissent, uh, and has massive implications for even just contributing uh, our own resources and time to, you know, NGOs and movements that are part of our community efforts to make our country, you know, hopefully stronger, whether they're uh, community service organizations, faith-based groups, whatever, all of that is going to be fair game for, for influence and manipulation. And unless we have better education and ideally better safeguards that, that create some road rules for that, just as there should be similarly for the laws of armed conflict or in international humanitarian law, I think development of similar tracks, at least on the domestic side, where it's incumbent to, to take action on that too, to avoid, you know, some of those very, very bleak worlds where, you know, these, these AR and VR, you know, riven societies uh, become a lot more brittle and a lot more susceptible. When you talk about that data being generated, do you see a future where there is privacy? Have we lost too much in some ways of our privacy is, is in some senses is the, is the horse out of the barn door when it comes to that kind of personal data and how it's used? I wrestle with this question a lot and in and, and part because I'm a parent and I have a different you know, understanding of, of sharing information than, than my children and how they do it online. So I think it's very generational. Uh, there are certain fundamentals that, again, you know, law help us uh, set out boundaries in terms of what is permissible and what is not uh, when it comes to accessing information or data. You know, a good example would be HIPAA in the medical community. Do we need more aggressive uh, creation of legislation or rule sets and norms that, that offer similar protections, you know, in the, in the, the, the non-medical world. 
that's that that I think is is worth exploring. The problem is is that that has immense economic consequences for some of our most powerful and biggest companies, uh, which we are also doing work to connecting people and, and creating uh, you know a global footprint technologically that that may be as important as any strategic outreach you know the U.S. has in the 21st century. Particularly when you're going like against Tencent or Baidu or or other Chinese uh, champions uh, that are that are part of their similar similar efforts to to make a mark on the world. You know, my my hope is that um, when we're thinking about the way that such technology allows us to understand who we are and how we relate to other people, that we have as much control over that as possible. That that data doesn't use to define us and and limit us in terms of what our what our possibilities are in our lives, whether it's educational, whether it's political, whether it's um, you know, social or socioeconomic. And, and that is something that, that I do worry about. The data will inevitably, like China's social credit system, be more about constraint and control than about opportunity. Uh, that's a very fundamental, you know, approach that I think from an American systems point of view, you know, we could fund, we could say, is this creating more opportunity in, in doing, you know, good is such a subjective term, but, uh, you know, but it's almost at that fundamental level, you know, is the point control or is the point, let's say, opportunity. Uh, I would like to say the latter is something that we could we could arrive at, but if some of the the, the trend lines again that that we're talking about when it comes to division or unrest, you know, are are pulled forward, that may not be the response. You know, the whole notion of contact tracing too is a really effective tool, obviously for mapping mapping outbreaks at a time when we need them. But those same tools can be used, of course, for 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 nefarious or other reasons, you know, social control, et cetera. And so Americans, I think, always have that skepticism, which is one have to really have some hard debates and, and maybe move forward uh, when, when we don't feel like we're ready because this technology is advancing and marching forward globally uh, and whether we're uh, in a position you know to study it debate it uh, is, is certainly going to be a, a, an open-ended one uh, and I think that's that's also incumbent on, on the kind of political process too to move at, at a faster speed but to do so still in a thoughtful way so that we're not shortchanging in the near term uh, or kind of our long-term future. In your predictions, one of our uh, attendees asks, uh, you discussed the surprising prediction, but what might you consider the, the coolest as well as uh, the scariest or strangest? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one too. I think, you know, on the scary side, I would probably revert again back to the cyber vulnerability and the uh, you know, algorithmic division. Um, you know, on the coolest, uh, you know, I, I think it's really interesting to see the rise of uh, the way that mobility will change in the future, I guess is how I'd say it. You know, there's a, there's a, a way that, that, you know, we kind of think about the autonomous car movement today as being fairly linear. Um, but, you know, when you start thinking about flying cars or personal, you know, aviation, I think is a really fascinating aspect to a, a way of moving around in a country as big as ours that potentially could, I think, helpfully bridge people and, and, and actually allow much more close contact. Um, obviously today in the era of social distancing, that probably doesn't sound like the best idea, but, but thinking through further, uh, that kind of a transportation you know, revolution or mobility revolution would be really, really interesting. I would love to, be, to see that, that come to fruition, especially if it can be done in a way that's actually sustainable and isn't disruptive. Um, you know, I think some of the, the, the augmented reality for all the, the peril that goes with that would be really interesting to see how that can be used to uh, do things like teach and train, you know, so that you're effectively able to move people outside of classrooms more and, and, and have, you know, the, the mindset that, that a technology is used as a, as a, as a tool for good uh, rather, than, rather than, than one for evil, you know, or, or, or you know, bad, by bad actors. My, you know, my, my position is that I'm, a, I'm an optimist who stares into the abyss. You know, I'm not a, a dystopian, you know, nihilist here who just, you know, thinks that it's all going to, to, to end badly for us all. But I, am, but I am, maybe this is my journalism training or just the way I'm wired, but I am quite skeptical and, and, and want to understand, you know, where our, where our assumptions are. And that I think, you know, inherent in that, that response to, to this very thoughtful question is, you know, there's a duality, of course, to technology, right? You know, and it's often we, the people, who are using it, who are deciding whether it's, you know, quote unquote, for good or bad. And I think that's really important to remember in, in any of these kind of conversations about what's coming down the pike, particularly with, with very ill-defined or, or hard to define, um, you know, fields like AI, you know, which, which, is, which is a nebulous, uh, you know, kind of family of, of very advanced and capable technologies that we're still trying to decide, uh, you know, how, how, how much of it works, you know, how Google Translate actually works is still a bit mysterious, for example. And yet we're also, 
having leaders of pretty much every major corporation say it's an important priority to have more AI, yet it's quite quite ill understood uh, and, and and maybe even ill badly implemented. And so I think that's part of the the challenge too, is that the the vaporware part of our our world uh, where we put faith in technology that isn't actually ready or real uh, is a risk. And and in part of the the world of Burnin that we built, where we we want to have systems in there that reflect actual possible developments and breakthroughs uh, is a really is a really critical part of the story. And so the things that you read in the book, as crazy as they might sound, are based on stuff that's out there today. Uh, so that, that question of what's cool, scary, um, is a very, very applied one, uh, you know, in, in the context of the story. And that in a way answers one question we have here where it's, you know, asking, are we sowing the seeds of our own destruction when it comes to our faith in technology. And that might be the, the glass half empty uh, look at this. And I don't want to force you into a binary half empty, half full, but also asking when you look at the future to another question asks, uh, what is there that you think will be better for people that can give you give us hope about the future? What about uh, this future would be better than some ways today? Uh, those are both really good questions. And, and I think with with many of the major breakthroughs that we've had that have been disruptive or truly globally scalable, uh, there is that duality, you know, where our, our demise is wrapped up in, in, in the possibility. Um, you know, nuclear power is probably too obvious of an example. I can't really think of a better one though, so I'll go with that. And, and some people do equate AI with like nuclear power. So, so maybe I'm safe in saying that. Um, you know, at the, at the same time, you know, being able to think about that sort of a future in a way where again we have agency control over what's ahead is, is really important. You know, if if there is uh, an exclusion of perspectives from the possible futures to not allow people who can imagine bad case scenarios, for example, then we then we run the risk of failure of imagination, which is to me unforgivable and, and unacceptable. I, I'm I'm heartened by it though, like in the AI community, and I'm a history major and I have a public administration degree too. I'm not a I'm not a technical you know person nor an engineer, but there is in that field, for example, a lot of room for folks who understand narrative, who understand ethics, who understand these adjacent and not seemingly relevant issues, in part because of the world-changing aspect of those of those you know basket of technologies. One of the things I'm most excited about, and, and another way of framing you know the world that Keegan lives in, is is in just redefining what it means to work. You know, and as someone who's both been on my own and also worked for big institutions, I've, I think about this a lot just as a practical matter, you know, uh, you know, in the format of what I'm doing and how and why. But, you know, imagine a world in which we actually have more prosperity and less concern with some of the fundamentals about how do we stay healthy? Uh, how do we prepare for what comes after when our working phases of our lives are, are wrapping up? I wouldn't call it retirement because I don't think anybody really retires anymore. You know, how we, how we pay and afford education. Um, you know, th there is certainly the potential with AI technologies and, and robotics to some extent too, to make transformational breakthroughs that, that fundamentally upend the economics of, of those really, really, in, in most people's lives, powerful forces. So, so, you know, the things that I would look forward to would be, of course, those discrete advancements, but the, but the challenge and the thing I hang up on is they have to happen, of course, in a context that's much larger than any one breakthrough. And can I envision a world where we're allowed to you know, turn the medical system on its head uh, to allow, for example, more care to more people for less money? Can I imagine a world in which education can still rise to the level of an elite institution and confer some of that same uh, social benefit, et cetera, but also be accessible to anybody who wants to attend? Uh, and can I imagine a world in which the notion of retirement is fundamentally different because what we do when we decide to pursue professions or, or passions or whatever it might be, uh, that actually isn't even a concept we use. We simply choose you know, a path and, and it winds and, and, and curves, but allows us to fulfill as humans what we feel is most meaningful. You know, and it may not be income. It may not be the conventions of social status today. And I know this sounds a little bit out there, but, but that's, I think, the aspirational you know, mindset you can start to think through, that there shouldn't be limits in terms of trying to think about how great it could be, uh, because in fact, that's how you almost think strategically about how could you get there and what would that world actually be like? Would it be one I would want to live in personally for my family and my kids to grow up? We have another question here as we start to get close to the end, but 
one that's always a fun one when you do a Q&A, president slash king for a day, what would be the three things you would do to position America for success in this future? Well, I won't announce my 2028 campaign today, but uh, the, you know, the, I'll, I'll answer this in a fairly narrow and I don't know if it's gonna be a satisfying way, but, but talking about, for example, this, this theme in terms of how, how we work and why, um, you know, being able to, starting in 2020, have a different conversation about moving forward from this period of massive and historic unemployment to ensuring that people are going to be able to keep their homes, keep their families fed and safe. Uh, you know, there is a longer arc that, that that narrative in America is beginning caused by this pandemic. Uh, and that's not to say that we have to have a radical expansion of you know, social programs and that sort of thing, but really starting a national conversation about how we take care and look after those who can. Uh, because that ties into, I think, especially in this national defense strategy that prioritizes great power conflict, how resilient we might be. Uh, should the unthinkable happen too. And so I see a lot of linkage in that. And so understanding the role that uh, public health plays in resiliency, the understanding that you know, economic the disadvantage plays in, in decreasing resiliency. Um, you know, retraining is, is, a, is a, a, a really valuable you know, thread to pull in terms of what Americans who have worked in industries that are going to be affected by software and robotic automa automation uh, will be doing next. But the reality is it's gonna be really, really difficult to create the same levels of opportunities at the same scale. So understanding how do we uh, help people figure out what we're going to be doing in a time that doesn't look like today, but yet has some of the same pressures uh, and same discourse, right? You know, being a writer, I'm certainly not immune to a natural language processing you know, program, being able to replicate and write a better thriller than, than what I can come up with. And so, you know, understanding what is the value of what I do to me, but also to society, what is my mission? I right? really having that conversation about what we're about uh, collectively is, is just one of the fundamentals, I think, of national leadership in the political realm. Uh, I don't even think it should be, should be you know, pure sci-fi as, as a conversation, but I would like to see more of that. And so those are, those are you know, either both really expensive propositions or, or, or quite cheap in terms of, you know, things like discourse. Uh, but it requires, I think, courting a lot of risk for, for leaders who are, who are unafraid to step out in front of some of these issues today, especially when they're not popular conversations or run afoul of a lot of our very conventional dynamics and talking about you know, these, these really elemental questions. Final question I'll give to my uh, colleague, Joshua Huminski. He's raised his hand, so I'm gonna uh, put him on audio here and feel free to also let him know how you feel about his uh, review of your work. <laughs> No, thank you very much again for, for doing this. Uh, if it wasn't clear from the review, I absolutely loved the book. Uh, I was very, very excited to read it. And it's great to have you here at CSPC. Um, I want to take a step back and sort of pair Burn In with Ghost Fleet together. Because one of the big things that we're looking at CSPC this year under Rep Nye's leadership and Chairman Rogers' leadership is great power competition and how it's going to play out in new and novel domains. Reading your books, we're seeing both Ghost Fleet and Burn-In, some incredible technological advances, but some serious competition between a very authoritarian model in China and a liberal Western demo democratic model in the United States. How do you see that playing out and how can the United States position itself for success in that environment where you have you know, Beijing saying, we want to be the dominant digital dominance by 2025. AI is the new superpower, super weapon, however you want to look at it. Um, how do we go forward in this environment and the new era of great power competition? I wanna, wanna, I'm going to uh, start by thanking you for the review, and in part because it had my favorite line, I think, that I've read yet about the book, which said, uh, you know, the Vernon is like Michael Bay meets Stephen Hawking. So that's, uh, that's pretty much what we're going for. So that's, uh, that's heartening to, to hear that, that it connected with you that way. Uh, I love this question because it's, it's so on point, you know, and we're, we're certainly... Um, thinking about that, even in, in the world that we build, you know, which is uh, a domestic focused one, you know, that, that world of Laura Keegan is one where, you know, there is, of course, a China, a Russia, uh, other groups that are, that are outside the U.S. Uh, vying for dominance globally. You know, when, how do you get from today to a point in which, you know, what we're talking about in a decade out, you know, we look back and say, oh, we, we, we made the right decisions. So I might actually start from that perspective of like, you know, beginning in 2030 uh, in a world that you wanted to, to create, where let's say we regained the upper hand in, in public narrative, uh, some moral authority, and we're able to uh, push back on the technological dominance uh, that's, that's currently, you know, being pushed out of, out of Beijing with the Chinese Communist Party. 
you know, that happens from, I think, of course, you know, having a better offer for the world. You know, we in the 20th century, you know, have effectively, you know, wired the global economy to integrate with the, the systems that we, we, we have. And, and we are certainly, you know, at risk. That is not assured, you know, in the next, you know, 20, 20 years or so that that will remain the case. I mean, looking at China's role uh, in Europe and the kind of very quiet uh, contest to, you know, reshape the transatlantic relationship, I think is absolutely critical to be right on top of. But, but a lot of this starts at home. Uh, you know, this simple concept of resiliency, you know, is, is something that is talked about at a lot of different levels in, in DC at different policy and think tank initiatives, and I, and I do think it's important, but really understanding what it means in the great power context, which is often not how it's described. Usually it's in the context of natural disaster, climate change, which of course also continue to happen as we, as we, as we you know, try to beat back a Beijing consensus. One of, my, one of my concerns, I guess, if I, if I think forward, is in fact that we won't have uh, an offering that is as compelling to our traditional allies that you know, this uh, social credit system that Beijing is perfecting in fairly repressive ways will be available in almost like a light version. And that other countries who we've traditionally been partnered with will be uh, amenable to implementing that, particularly if it is wrapped up in the kind of high-speed machine-to-machine communication that the 5G networks by, uh, produced by Huawei and other com- uh, Chinese companies promise. You know, today, it's, it's a big challenge if Turkey, for example, buys Russian S-400s and they want to operate the F-35. But imagine, you know, a NATO ally, uh, you know, goes through with some of the, the systems today, not just in the conventional 5G tech that we're talking about in 2020, but if every aspect of their society is moving through effectively a Chinese architecture, and that the temptation, of course, from political leaders will be to, you know, look at some of the, the other aspects of that system, uh, is not just in a hardware sense, but in software. Uh, and that software paradigm is certainly all about what the technological dominance is really about. Um, in this AI era, you know, the, the, the vessel or the vehicle, you know, doesn't matter as much as, as the ability to produce code and, 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 and use data in ways that, that other countries like, like potential adversaries can. Um, I, think, I think fundamentally, though, you know, being able to have that, again, from a, of a conversation that begins, where are we trying to get to, right? This to me is fundamental in strategy and often overlooked that we're not building out that world enough where we wanna be, because to me, uh, it's a lot easier to see where you need to go to get there. So that, that kind of an initiative that, that looks forward to this great power, uh, is looking forward within a great power uh, context, you know, should, should also be, I think, keeping in mind the world that you're aspiring to, and then also you know, spending some time on the world you're, you're, you're trying to avoid too. You know, China's, uh, we, we underestimate China continuously, and we're doing, I think, a better job at appreciating the technological capabilities of not just the PLA, but, but Chinese firms, you know, that wasn't always the case. You know, just a few years ago, we were, you know, kind of looking, I think, without the seriousness that, that their commitment, uh, you know, required at the time. And, and now we're seeing, you know, fifth generation-ish, you know, fighters. We're seeing uh, warships that, that match our own. We're seeing the world's, you know, arguably some of the world's most capable AI companies and, and, and operating in a way that is going to be wholly and fundamentally different from, from how our tech sector works. And, so we have to learn to make that our advantage and not our weakness. And what we're risking right now, I think, is that we're tilting towards that, that uh, brittleness or, or lack of resiliency by the way that we're allowing those platforms to foment division and, and, uh, and create essentially a lot uh, of problems online that are translating to, to the real world. And that's only going to increase. So that's certainly, I think, how I would start to think about that great power question. It's a great initiative. Why don't I go, go ahead and um, just say thank you so much, August. Um, you have deftly handled a lot of great questions from the audience. I appreciate your effort to once again with Burn In uh, take us through an intellectual process of looking into the future. And as you suggested, deciding whether these trends are things that we are happy to live with or things that we would like to try to influence while we've still got an opportunity to do that and help us think a little bit more strategically about um, the difference between those two things. So I I just want to thank you for sharing your time with us this morning. Um, I mentioned at the outset, we we spend a lot of our effort trying to help policymakers understand technologies that are rapidly changing. There are clearly some of those technologies, particularly in the national security sphere, for example, where it's sufficient for leaders to understand them and not and the public doesn't necessarily need to, to dive into the details of how AI works, but there are clearly technologies like cybersecurity, as you mentioned, and others 
digital economics where it's hard to have a public debate and reach any kind of consensus from the leadership level if the public isn't really prepared and educated to understand the nuances of the debate, to understand when they, a highly engaged digitally society doesn't really understand the economics that go on behind the screens, um, those debates become hard. So, you know, we've, we've always been big fans of this notion of digital education so that the public can be brought forward a little bit as well into that conversation in a more nuanced and detailed way. Um, we appreciate you taking the opportunity to help us think through a lot of these questions. Very much look forward to, uh, to burn in. And thanks again for, for sharing this, this hour with us this morning. It was a, a privilege and thank you again for, uh, for having me on and, and everybody uh, have a safe weekend. Thanks, bye-bye.